everyone and welcome to this lecture. So this is the HSC Physics um, July lectures. Um, so yeah, I'll start off by talking a little bit about myself. So hello everyone, my name is uh, Thamika. I graduated in 2022 with an ATAR of 99.30. Uh, the subjects that I did in the HSC were Physics, Chemistry, Math Advanced, Math Extension 1, English Advanced and English Extension 1. Um, I'm currently studying a pathway to med in Queensland and uh, yeah, in terms of fun, I guess there's not much like I, I do a variety of stuff now, but I guess I've written down Valorant because that was what I was doing when I was making these slides. So yeah, that's just a little bit about myself, but now I'll talk a little bit about ATAR notes. So since 2007, we've been offering heaps of free resources to make sure students just like you can thrive in their studies. So we've offered free lectures just like these ones since 2015. And these free lectures are in line with ATARNOTE's mission to help students as much as possible. And so we have tons of free resources for you. So here are just some of the things that we offer. So you can find pretty much everything at atarnotes.com. And so in terms of what we offer, we have like study notes and newsletters and stuff. And if you want more info and tips on how to use these resources, you can check out the info doc under the resources section of this lecture page. So we have, um, yeah, we have free notes. We have free videos, free guides from past students. And if you have questions after the lecture, the best place to go is the Q and A where current and past students just like me can answer your questions for you. And if you're looking for even more support, we've got you covered. So we have some premium resources for you guys. We offer low cost group and private tutoring, printed study guides, and online access to study resources with Ed Unlimited. So yeah, we have a lot of things on offer for you guys because we, re we really wanna see you guys succeed as well. But now that we got that out of the way, we can get started with the lecture itself. So what are we gonna be covering today? Well, in terms of what we're gonna be covering today, um, we're going to be going through module five, module six, and module seven, a little bit about my personal study tips, what I found the hardest to understand and how to get those marks as well. So yeah, module five, six, seven, kind of like preparation for your trials as well. So yeah, let's get started. So let's start initially with projectile motion. So the inquiry question goes, how can models that I use to explain projectile motion be used to analyze and make predictions? So Projectile motion then, as a definition, projectile motion is the motion of an object acted on only by a constant vertical force. So if you go back to module five, you'll know that within a projectile, there's only one constant force in it. And if we wanna be even more specific, um, it's a constant vertical force because I'm talking about gravity. So gravity is all this, this always constant force. And yeah, if you think back to it, we know that there's no horizontal force acting on it because we we, if we're throwing a ball, for example, that's like a projectile that will most likely undergo parabolic motion. Once we, once the ball leaves our hand, we're no longer pushing on the ball. And so there is no horizontal force. However, we have given it a vertical velocity. And so that vertical velocity upwards will decelerate because gravity, which will be a force, will act downwards. So it will cause downwards acceleration. So yeah, that's just like kind of an intro into projectiles. But the other thing is, we don't consider air resistance in HSC because that would complicate things quite a bit. So we don't consider air resistance and gravity is always constant. So yeah, the other thing is that my first tip, I guess, would be that the formula sheet is your best friend. So the other tip that I would give is always make sure to underline or highlight your question. So I, I don't think, I'm not exactly sure if a highlighter is allowed in your school exam. So in the HSC, I think it's allowed in the HSC, but um. Yeah, I always underlined my questions, at least the long parts. Um, so for example, like nine markers or some hard calculation questions, I would definitely make sure to underline the different sections because the way I answered questions or the way that I learned to answer questions was, um, I basically broke down the questions into different parts. So I would kind of like try and predict where different marks would be allocated because something that I really struggled with in my HSC year was like, aligning with the marking criteria so to to actually get the marks and the marking criteria because like a lot of my comments on my exams were like it was evident that i knew the content but i didn't 
I, I didn't put down the right content. I didn't put down what the marking criteria was looking for. So I, re I ended up just underlining sections of each question so that I'd know, or like I'd get a good idea of where they were probably going to give marks. And then I could write to these different sections and therefore I'd maximize my ability or potential of getting marks and aligning with the marking criteria. So yeah, uh, kind of that's my second tip, I guess. Other thing is remember your key points. So gravity is always negative. Um, VY or sorry, VY. So vertical velocity is always zero at the top of the parabola. Um, and horizontal and vertical components are always separate. So we always solve them separately. Uh, and then I guess you can write down the five formulas. So in the, in the horizontal direction, we have V is equal to U. So final velocity is equal to initial velocity. Why would we say that? Because there is no um, acceleration, right? So if you, it's essentially the same formula as this, except we know that A is equal to zero because there is no horizontal acceleration. And so because A is equal to zero, we have AT is equal to zero. And so we can simply say V is equal to U. So in the horizontal direction, VX is equal to UX. And the change in X, right, displacement, the change in X is equal to UT, um, initial velocity times time. So quite simple formulas for the horizontal direction. In the vertical direction, however, we need to account for acceleration. So we have the standard um, SUVAT equations that you might have come across in uh, year 11. So V squared is equal to U squared plus 2AS or 2A change in Y. We say Y because it's in the vertical direction right now. So if you're going to rewrite this, I would say VY squared. So the final vertical velocity squared is equal to ui squared plus 2as and then in the vertical direction we also have uh displacement vertical displacement so sy or delta y is equal to ut plus half at squared uh, again initial vertical velocity and vertical acceleration which will be 9.8 and then we also have v equals u plus at so in vertical direction, we need to consider acceleration because gravity is present. And in the horizontal direction, we can just neglect the presence of acceleration. All right. So now we can go through a question. So uh, 2012 HSE question. So this is worth four marks. Um, so a toy bird is launched at 60 degrees to the horizontal from a point 45 meters away from the base of the cliff. All right. Calculate the magnitude of the required launch velocity such that the toy bird strikes the base of the wooden building at the top of the cliff, 34 meters above launched height. So uh, also the next tip would be to never forget SI units and direction for vectors. So always keep that in mind. These types of questions are where silly mistakes come from. They're, in my opinion, the most painful type of mistakes. But okay, so let's, let's look at what data they've given us. So they've given us 45 meters of um, horizontal uh, range, 34 meters of vertical range, and the angle is at 60 degrees. All right, so knowing that now, um, to solve this question, first what we do is we'll write down the formulas that we'll be using. Another good thing is, so another tip, uh, I guess coming out of nowhere is, um, with these types of calculation questions, I always like to solve everything algebraically before subbing in the values. It just makes things a lot cleaner in my opinion and also a lot easier to spot calculator errors because if you think about it, if I sub in all my data at the beginning of the question and then I keep moving around like my data, right, to rearrange it and like add and subtract and multiply and stuff, I can make calculation errors all the way throughout that, right? It'll be very hard to spot where I make my calculation errors. Whereas if I sub it in at the end, then I know that there's only one area where I've made, where I've subbed in my values. So it's a lot easier to spot calculator errors and it just is a lot easier in my opinion to visualize the variables and like, you know, move everything around. So. Yeah, so write down the formulas, write down all the known variables, and then place these variables into the formula with one or two unknowns. So we have v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as, um, s is equal to ut plus half at squared, or delta y is equal to ut plus half at squared, and we have v is equal to u plus at. And then in the x direction, uh, or the horizontal direction, we have v is equal to u, and delta x is equal to ut. So with that said, we can do uh, in the y direction, we have s is equal to 30, uh, 34 meters, right? The displacement is equal to 34 meters. We have, um, uh, we have v, is, uh, sorry, u, so the total velocity, the, sorry, the, in the y direction, so ui is equal to u sine 30, which is equal to 
um, root 3 over 2u. And v, uh, well, we don't know v. So we also have a now. a is equal to negative 9.8 meters per second per second, or meters per second squared. So that's a constant um, acceleration downwards, that's gravity. And we have t, which we don't know either. In the x direction, we have s x, or s in the horizontal direction is equal to 45 meters. And we have u is equal to u cos 60, which is equal to um, u over 2. And we have v, which, um, well, we kind of do know, v will be the same as u. So v will also be like u over 2. So we don't really know what v is, but like we can, it's equivalent to u. We have a, which is equal to 0. And we have t, which we don't know. So all equations have two unknowns. Hence, we must use simultaneous equations with either uh, u or t or v or t. So we have delta x is equal to ut and s is equal to u over 2t. Um, so t is equal to a0 um, over u. And we have, on the second side, we have the change in displacement is equal to ut plus half at squared. And so we have 34, so this is in the y direction. 34 is equal to root 3 over 2u plus minus 4.9t squared. This 4.9 comes from half a. So half of 9.8 is, or half of negative 9.8 is 4.9, so we have minus 4.9t squared. So if I sub 1 into 2 now, yeah, so if I sub 1 into 2 now, I will get, sorry, um, t will be equal to 90 over u, sorry, because s is 45. So yeah, if I sub in 1 into 2 now, what I will get is, um, so I will sub in t into u, so I will get 34 is equal to root 3 over 2 u times 90 over 4, uh, 90 over yes yes uh times um 90 over uh over 4 um sorry 90 over u sorry i keep mixing up so 34 is equal to root 3 over um root 3 over 2u times 90 over u minus 4.9 times 90 over u squared so that will give us 34 is equal to 45 root 3 minus 39690 over u squared and that will give us a value for u of 30 meters per second. So in this case, normally with projectile motions, you don't often end up um, doing simultaneous equations, but it is a very viable possibility, as you can see in this HSC question. So it is something that you should be prepared for. But yeah, that's how you would solve this question. Um, yeah, moving on. We can now look at the sources of acceleration. So acceleration in projectile motion can come from other sources as well. So questions aren't just going to be like what we had before where it's like um, a toy bird or like a projectile or something is launched because in this case, the force is acting on acting is gravity. They can also simulate this type of scenario, or emulate this type of scenario in, let's say, like perpendicular electric fields or like um, uniform electric fields, like between two perpendicular charged plates. Um, where like you can say ignore gravity and an electron is going through the plate in this case There will be a constant force formed by the electric field, right? So that's why you can see a visualization over here So yeah, the acceleration that comes in these examples is not necessarily from gravity So we could have e is equal to v over d So then f is equal to qe and a is equal to f over m so there are different scenarios where we could get um, acceleration from other sources as well. Again, here, I would really recommend um, familiar, familiarizing yourself with the data sheet. So you know all the formulas. So E is equal to V over D. So they could give you like uh, voltage and distance and ask you to find like the acceleration that an electron will experience, for example. And that might stump a lot of people. Well, um, uh, familiarizing with yourself with the data sheet will allow you to realize that, oh wait, um, voltage and distance, I instantly have E, and so I can find F is equal to QE, given that they said it's an electron, so I have charge as well, and so I can find mass as well, I can find acceleration as well, sorry, because I have mass in my formula sheet, so A is equal to F over M. So yeah, just familiarizing yourself with all the info and knowing that acceleration can come from other sources as well. Now we can go through circular motion. Um, the inquiry question in this is, uh, why do objects move in circles? So, uniform circular motion is the motion of an object traveling in a circle at a constant speed. So in this case, the speed is constant. Uh, velocity vectors are changing by the, uh, therefore by the equation A equals V squared over R, acceleration is also changing. So that's something that's very important. and the fact that acceleration is changing, it might not even be um, 
might not even be touched on in this module, but it'll definitely be touched on in things like uh, module six and module eight as well. So yeah, but these are kind of the, the constant features of uniform circular motion. The fact that the speed is always constant, the velocity vectors are changing because well, the direction is changing and so hence velocity is also changing. And the fact that acceleration is also changing due to the direction changing. So what does this mean then? F is equal to ma, acceleration is not equal to zero, force is not equal to zero, because again, distance is changing. So there's oh, there's gonna be a net force, and that net force is what we call centripetal force. So um, the net force um, is what, net force inwards is what we're gonna be calling a uh, centripetal force. Um, that will be denoted by F is equal to mv squared over r, right? Because it's F is equal to ma. And so it, by the formula or by the equation, a is equal to v squared over r, we can get f is equal to mv squared over r. So the definition then, centripetal force is the force that directs objects towards the center of a circular path. That's what you would say the, the definition would be. So, all right. So as I mentioned before then, centripetal force is a resultant force and centripetal force always points towards the center of a circular path. So always towards the center. So because it will act in kind of the same direction as acceleration, always act in the towards the center of a circular path. And this will kind of come into play when we touch up on module six, where you'll observe the motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. Um, but yeah, centripetal force always acts towards the center of a circular path. And um, centripetal force is also always a net force. So you don't end up drawing centripetal force in a, in a force body diagram because we don't end up drawing the net force. We only end up drawing like direct forces that act on it. So centripetal force is a type of net force or resultant force. And so we don't draw it in the, in the force body diagrams. So doing this question now, find the centripetal, sorry, find the centripetal force experienced by the mass with tension of 10 newtons and an angle at 30 degrees. Well, centripetal force is a resultant force and points to the center of a circular path. So what we do is we'd follow the steps, we'll draw the force body diagram, and then we'll resolve the vectors, right? Because it would be the net force. So if tension is acting like this, and I'm assuming the ball isn't just falling down, then that means that the vertical forces are balanced, which means that the only other vertical force that can counteract gravity can be the vertical component of tension. So the force that, so if I imagine a triangle like this, right, a triangle like that, this vertical component, hopefully you can see my cursor, hopefully the, if you can see my cursor, the vertical component of tension will be the force that um, counteracts the force of gravity. And so now the object won't be moving in the, in the vertical direction. But there is a central, there's a resultant force that points towards the center of the circular path. And this will be the unresolved horizontal component of tension. So in this case, the horizontal component of tension will act as the centripetal force. How would we solve the horizontal component of tension then? Well, we can do uh, 10 cos 30, because cos 30, so um, 10, cos, 10 cos 60, sorry, because cos 60 will be this horizontal component or 10 sine 30, same thing. So 10 cos 60 or 10 sine 30, depending on where you draw your um, triangle essentially. If I draw my triangle like this, right? If I draw my triangle like this, if you can see my cursor, then the answer will be 10 sine 30 to find this component. If I draw my triangle like this though, again, hopefully you can see my cursor, the component will be 10 cos 60 and that will be equal to five newtons. All right, so what is then the centripetal force on a bank track? So again, it would be to draw diagrams force is the vector sum of the normal and weight force, right? The centripetal force will be the vector sum of the normal and weight force. And so to calculate, you should find the horizontal and vertical components of both forces and then add them. So I think this one will be a similar scenario to our tension question where the, the normal force, the vertical component will, uh, will um, balance out with gravity. And then we have left the, um, the horizontal component of normal force that will act as the centripetal force then. So yeah. Now we can move on to torque. So torque is the turning moment of a force. So we have torque is equal to RF. Um, the next tip is don't memorize whether to use sine theta or cos theta. So a lot of times you might see uh, in textbooks or something, you might see RF sine theta. So 
that is kind of misleading because it's assuming that the angle is directed in one way. What the actual formula is, and I'm pretty sure this is what's on your formula sheet as well, what it's actually looking for is uh, RF, so R perpendicular F. So when the, when the force acts in the perpendicular direction, that is what they're looking for. So keep that in mind. So don't memorize whether to use sine theta or cos theta because it changes case by case. And a lot of questions are designed so you can't use the formula as itself. So you can't use RF sine theta. You'll have to look at whichever way the force is perpendicular. So because I mentioned that now, we can say now, torque is achieved by applying a force perpendicular to the object. All right, so let's now look at motion in gravitational fields. So how does the force of gravity determine the motion of planets and satellites? So this is like the, the more content part of module five. So definition then, orbital motion is a uniform circular motion of an object whereby the centripetal force is provided by gravity. So we can use this to find orbital velocity as well, which is the minimum velocity required, the minimum velocity required for an object to orbit a planetary body or an object to orbit a planet, for example. So within this, um, within these two equations, we have u is equal to um, u is equal to negative gmm over r, that is gravitational potential energy, and f is equal to gmm over r squared. So in this case, r is the distance from the center of the mass, and r is an altitude is equal to, so yeah, r in this case is the distance from the center of the mass, uh, whereas altitude is um, altitude, right? r is equal to the radius of the planet plus the altitude. So in altitude questions, you need to say, this is where things get confusing as well, because it can say a satellite is at an altitude of something. You need to be uh, sure if they've accounted for the radius of the planet as well, because that's a case where a lot of people um, end up making calculator errors as well. Their method could be right, but they forget to add the radius of the planet as well. And that could be a place where a lot of people lose marks as well. But yeah. We can now move on to gravitational potential energy. So all these definitions, they could be tested in like one to two markers. Um, so yeah, just make sure you know the content, right? So gravitational potential energy is the energy uh, possessed by an object when it is raised in a gravitational field. And what we need to know about this is GPE always holds a negative value. Uh, that is because GPE originates or is at z or equals zero or originates at some point infinitely far away. And so the further away we get from it, the more, the more like we're negative, right? So we're in the negative values. And so because we're talking about um, gravitational potential energy being zero at a point infinitely far away from the point that we're measuring from, we will always be in a, like GPE will always hold a negative value. That doesn't mean that the change in GPE is different because a change in GPE can be positive, but GPE standalone can hold a negative, is always a negative value. So we have now two formulas, right, that we should know, escape velocity and orbital velocity. I'd recommend uh, in your questions deriving these formulas because I don't think it's in your data sheet. So if you have a formula in your data sheet, you don't need to derive it. If it's not in your formula sheet, then you would have to derive it because it's not considered like known, like pre-known pre content. So with escape velocity, if we're going to, um, if we're going to like uh, derive the equation, we can let um, energy initial equal energy final, right? Because there's conservation of energy. So what we'll do is we'll break it down. So we have initial gravitational potential and initial um, kinetic, so U plus K, and initial um, and final gravitational potential and final kinetic, right? Let's think about what escape velocity means. Escape velocity is the minimum velocity required for an object to escape the gravitational field of the thing that it's trapped in, right? The minimum velocity required. So at that minimum velocity, sorry, because it's minimum velocity, as it like reaches the very end of, as it's like finally escaped, right? Because it's minimum velocity, the moment it escapes the gravitational um, field, uh, it will basically run out of speed, right? Because it's the minimum velocity required so that it will use up all of its energy to, to basically leave the, leave the field. And because of that, we can say kinetic energy is zero because after it leaves the field, it will stop moving because it's a minimum energy required. So half mv squared is equal to zero. Same way, we can also say GPE is also equal to zero because 
when we've escaped the gravitational potential field, that basically means we have reached that point that is infinitely far away, that point where GPE equals zero. And so we can say now our final E is equal to zero. So now we have energy initial. So we have half MV squared is equal to negative, uh, sorry, minus GMM over R. So we have half MV squared is equal to GMM over R. So solving that formula now, we can do V squared is equal to 2GM over R and we will get our escape velocity value as V equals root 2GM over R. So that is our value for escape velocity. And we can also solve orbital velocity. So what will we do when we're solving orbital velocity? Well, if you think about the setup for orbital velocity, um, we're just like in orbital velocity, it's not always uniform circular motion, like it's elliptical, like, like the Earth will orbit the Sun in an elliptical orbit. But for the sake of the equation, we're going to consider it as a uniform circular motion. So if that planetary or like if that object is undergoing uniform circular motion over the planetary body, then that would mean that um, there will be a centripetal force, right? Centripetal force in this case would act perpendicular, right? And if it's acting perpendicularly, it will basically be acting downwards, right? Downwards towards the center of the Earth. The only other force that acts downwards towards the center of the Earth that we currently know of is gravity. So in this, if to solve orbital velocity, what we do is we let the centripetal force equal to gravitational force, as you can see over here. So we have mv squared over r is equal to gmm over r squared. So we have v squared is equal to gm over r. And then we have v is equal to root 2 gm, uh, root gm over r, sorry. So escape velocity, v is equal to root 2 gm over r, and v is equal to root gm over r. This is another reason why I recommend that um, you guys uh, aim to derive the formulas because um, you can get confused. So because these two formulas are pretty similar, you can end up getting confused. But if you derive them, then you generally have an understanding of where the formulas come from. And you're also able to explain that understanding and show that understanding in your in your answers as well. So yeah, basically the total energy is equal to U plus K um, change in, so total energy in this sense can be calculated by U plus K, which will be equal to negative GMM over two R, negative GMM over two R, uh, the change in energy between orbits is equal to final energy minus initial energy. Increasing orbit equals positive work, which equals positive change. Decreasing orbit equals negative work, which equals negative change. So for this question, U plus, for the question U plus K, we will use our value for, um, we'll use our known value for velocity, which will be orbital, which, sorry, which will be orbital velocity in this case. So yeah, but um, all right, we can now move on to satellites now. So with our understanding of satellites, uh, we have satellites are basically projectiles in space orbiting the earth in circular motion. So we have two types of satellites. We have LEO, lower earth orbit satellites, which orbit at a low altitude, a low altitude of around 200 to 2000 kilometers, right? And this makes this places it above the denser part of the atmosphere. And by placing it above the denser part of the atmosphere, what we're doing is we're reducing drag. And so that kind of helps the satellite stay in orbit for longer. And uh, if you think about the orbital period of the LEO satellites, it has an orbital period of less than 128 minutes. And so these are some of the properties. So in terms of explaining questions about satellites, you need to think about the properties and then relate the properties to its uses. So it's got a low altitude, it's got its, um, or main feature is the fact that it's got a low altitude, right? And because it has a low altitude, it's pretty good for, um, it's pretty good for communications, reconnaissance and imaging. So earth observation as well as reconnaissance, those are some pretty good uses for lower earth orbit satellites. We also have geostationary satellites. So geostationary satellites orbit at around 36,000 kilometers, an altitude of around 36,000 kilometers. And what's, um, well, you can see what's special about it because it's part of the name. They are stationary. They appear stationary in the sky, right? So they're not, they're not stationary themselves, but they appear stationary in the skies because they have an orbital period of around 24 hours, 
So it has the same orbital period as that of the Earth. And so it will appear to be stationary exactly one spot above the Earth. So because of um, this feature now, uh, they will, they will, um, because of this feature, they will be used for um, a variety of things, such as uh, communication and broadcasting satellites. So communication, the reason why it's used for communication is because they're so high, they can cover such a wide area of the Earth's surface, and so they're pretty useful for communication. In terms of broadcasting satellites, right, if you think of satellite dishes, um, or just like just those like receiving dishes, right, um, if your uh, satellite appears stationary in the sky, then those receiver dishes only need to point to a one fixed position in the sky, right? They don't have to move around as the Earth orbits or as the satellite moves. So it's very useful in that case as well. All right, so now we can move on to electromagnetism. So we've moved, uh, so we've done basically like quite a bit of module five, right? So in terms of a summary of what we've done, we've looked at projectile motion right? We need to know the two things, constant force downwards, and that constant force downwards is going to be gravity. No force um, horizontally, right? So no force horizontally. Uh, so that's projectile motion um, basics, concepts, I guess. The important thing about projectile motion is knowing the formulas and applying the formulas in terms of getting good at projectile motion. Um, I think because um, projectile motion is not very content based and very calculation based. I think a good way is just to get a lot of practice. So you have a lot of experience dealing with different types of questions It's a bit different for other types of modules because uh, more content heavy modules, there are different ways of preparing for them. But as you can see this through the summary that we went through, right? Um, yeah, the only main types of content that we really covered was LEO and GEO. Uh, there are some other stuff like Kepler's laws. Um, which we won't get a chance to cover because we're not be going to be going through every single detailed part of everything that we've covered so far because the lecture is only two hours long. Um, but yeah, that is essentially module five. Uh, quick summary. And now that we've covered through module five, we can move on to module six. So we'll start with electromagnetism. So behavior of charged particles in electric and magnetic fields. So electric and magnetic fields kind of they will so in terms of force there's not much difference they will both generate force but they will generate different um types of uh, motion so electric fields will generate parabolic motion where magnetic fields will display circular motion so what do i mean by that well um think about like what i also like an electric field right it will it will generate a force in a constant direction, right? So if an electron is traveling between a positively charged plate on the top and a negatively charged plate on the bottom, uh, that electron will be attracted to the positively charged plate on the top. That positive, like, that electric field will generate a force upwards and a constant force upwards. So it will undergo parabolic motion, similar to um, the motion of a projectile in module five, because we only have one constant force. In this case, it's upwards, whereas with projectile motion, it will always be downwards because of gravity. So that explains its parabolic motion. With a magnetic field, however, it's a bit different. So magnetic fields, you can say the force exerted by a magnetic field is always perpendicular to both the direction of the magnetic field and the direction of the movement, motion, or velocity of the charged particle. So this is this is for a charged particle entering a magnetic field. So if that is the case then, then that means that the force will always be perpendicular to velocity. Where other case did we see that? Well, if I go all the way back, the other, the only other case where we saw where force is always perpendicular to velocity, right? Let's assume blue to be um, force and v and red to be velocity. The only other case where we saw that is uh, when we talked about uniform circular motion. So in this case, assuming that the assuming that the direction of the magnetic field is perpendicular to the direction of velocity of the charged particle, the force will always be perpendicular to velocity as well, and so it will undergo uniform circular motion it will start moving in a circle so um yeah so it will start moving in a circle so this one this particular example the magnetic field will always point to the to the left um 
the palm will point out of the page, right? And the thumb will point upwards. So it will undergo uniform circular motion like this, essentially. Something like that, where they will move upwards initially and then curve downwards and then move upwards and then curve downwards. So undergo uniform circular motion. Again, tip five, don't memorize the sine theta. Find the proportion of velocity perpendicular to the to the B field. So again, these are where questions might trick uh, people or attempt to trick people by trying to put in um, cases where sine theta doesn't apply and we'll have to look for cos theta. Basically, just think of it as finding the proportion of velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field and not always sticking to the sine theta rule. In terms of um, the direction, right? So this one is going to be towards the oppositely charged plate. So if it's a positive particle, it will move towards the negatively charged plate. And, it's, and if it's a negatively charged particle, it will move towards the positively charged plate. And that's because um, like charges repel and opposite charges attract. And then whereas with a magnetic field, we can use this, the right hand palm rule to calculate the direction of the uh, charged particle. So what angle should we use in this formula? QVB equals sine theta um, or QVB, uh, sorry, F equals QVB sine theta or QVB perpendicular. Well, we got to calculate the component of velocity that is perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. So if we use cos theta in this case, we'll calculate this component, right? That is parallel to the magnetic field. So in this case, we will be using sine theta because um, uh, F equals QVB sine theta will be calculating this component. Sine theta will be this component, right? And so this component is what we're looking at because that is perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, we'll be using sine theta. So a little bit more on the trajectories now. So this is um, also another place where you could be tested, right? Drawing the actual movement in electric and magnetic fields. I remember I got tested on this in my trials, or not trials, but one of my exams, I can't remember where, but we had to draw the motion of an electric field in between perpendicular charged plates. What's important is the electron will undergo like linear or straight line motion. And then the moment it hits this like electric field, it will start to undergo parabolic motion. So it will start to curve. And then the moment it leaves the electric field, it will once again, undergo straight line motion because no force will be acting on it. And that's what's very important. You'll need to draw these with straight lines, right, before and after. And you need to indicate that it's very strongly that it is parabolic motion. The other thing is to be careful is always, um, always draw these lines equally spaced apart. So these um, field lines, always draw them equally spaced apart. And always with a ruler as well, obviously. And then in, in a magnetic field, it's a little bit different. Right, we have QVB is equal to MV squared over R. So we can find radius, we can find this. So by equating these and canceling every one, so we have QB is equal to MV over R. We can basically find different values based on what we're given. But yeah, it will just undergo uniform circular motion. So you can see here, the force is always perpendicular. The velocity, even though it's traveling in different, um, in different directions, its plane will always be perpendicular to the plane of the magnetic field which will in turn always be perpendicular to plane of the um, force. But yeah, uh, now that that's uh, out of the way, there are different motions out of the way. We can now move on to um, accelerating charges. So accelerating charges, as I mentioned before, create a magnetic field. Current carrying conductors carry moving charges and therefore current carrying conductors must also create a magnetic field. So the, the way uh, accelerating charges create magnetic fields is accelerating charges create a changing electric field, right? Uh, changing electric fields lead to the, uh, or induce a changing magnetic field, which then induces a changing electric field and so on and so on. And this is from our understanding of Maxwell and Maxwell's four laws. So an electromagnetic wave essentially. So yeah, current carrying conductors must too create a magnetic field. So the direction given by the right hand grip rule right? Uh, and the direction given by the right hand grip rule will be the direction of um, this magnetic field. So the direction of field lines will be in a circle like that. So we have the direction of current. So I'll point my thumb to the direction of the current. And then the way my four fingers circulate or grip will be the direction of the field lines. So that's what accelerating charges will look like in a magnetic field. And we can look at the murder effect. So what is the definition of the murder effect? Well, the motor effect states that um, 
current carrying conductor in a magnetic field will experience a force. Again, we have, don't memorize this angle. So we have a formula F is equal to I or B or B I L, whichever way you want to say it. Um, but it's going to be perpendicular in a perpendicular direction. So we have sine theta added onto it, but don't memorize it to be sine theta, memorize it to be the perpendicular, um, the perpendicular vector or the perpendicular force. So yeah, because it could change from cos theta to sine theta. But with that out of the way now, you can look at parallel current carrying conductors. So this is the formula for force per unit length bet between two parallel current carrying conductors. So that is that formula. Um, how to answer questions now. So what I would recommend is, what I would recommend is you guys draw dots and crosses to indicate the direction of magnetic fields if it seems confusing. Um, if it doesn't, then you don't, you don't need to, but it, it, if these types of questions do seem confusing, then I would highly recommend drawing the dots and crosses to indicate the direction of magnetic fields and that are induced on one another, right? So the magnetic field that I2 will induce on I1 and the magnetic field that I1 will induce on I2. And this will really help with you guys determining whether this will pull or deflect other wires. So if we look at I1, right? It is, so I'll point my thumb upwards because it's going upwards and my four fingers, right? They will go into the page. They will initially go into the page, which means that I1 will induce a magnetic field that goes into the page on I2, right? So if it's going into the page on I2, then to calculate the force, we can use right-hand palm rule, right? So we have the four fingers indicating the direction of the magnetic field that I1 is, I2 is experiencing. So I2 is experiencing a magnetic field into the page from I1, right? And so my four fingers will go into the page the current in I2 is going upwards. So my thumb will point upwards and then my palm will point to the left. And so I have my red arrow pointing to the left. Same thing can be done from I2 to I1. So I2, my, my grip. So as my finger curves around, my fingers will leave the page, right? So as my finger curves around from my right hand grip, my fingers will leave the page. And so I, I2 will induce a magnetic field moving out of the page on I1. And so to solve this now, I will point my four fingers out of the page, my thumb upwards because current is going upwards in I1, and then my palm will point to the right. And so now I have a force to the right. And so this, a force to the left combined with the force to the right, indicates that when these two current carrying conductors are moving, are moving in the same direction, they will have an attractive force. So the force attracts. We can do a similar thing if they're moving in opposite directions. So what we'll do now is we will do, do the same thing essentially. So I2 now, right, to calculate the force that it will, the magnetic field that it will induce on I1, I will point my thumb downwards via right hand grip rule and my four fingers will appear to go into the page. So I now have a force going into the page induced on I1 by I2. So to calculate the force that's induced on I1, I will do my, f my four fingers going into the page and my thumb pointing upwards. And then I can see that my palm is facing outwards. So this is right hand palm rule. So my palm is facing outwards. And so I have a force going to the left. Same way now I can look at the force or the magnetic field that I1 induces on I2, right? The magnetic field that I1 induces on I2. So I resort to right hand grip rule first. So right hand grip rule, my thumb is pointing upwards, my grip, my four fingers can be seen going into the page, right? If it's going into the page, right? It's going into the page when my fingers are to the, to the right of I1, I2 is to the right of I1, right? So fingers going into the page, that means a magnetic field going into the page is induced on I2. So then to calculate the force and the direction of the force, I will point my four fingers into the page, my thumb downwards because current is flowing downwards. And I can see that my palm is facing to my right. So I have a force going to the right. So I have a force going to the left and a force going to the right. And you can see over here that this kind of indicates that when my current carrying conductors are going in opposite directions, we have a repelling force. So that's what this kind of proves. And this is how you would prove it. You would, well, you wouldn't be able to do the dots and crosses, right? But you would, so you wouldn't be able to do the grip rules. You can't physically call an examiner to to test you on their grip rule. So what you do is you draw the dots and crosses that one would um, induce on the other one. 
So yeah, if you see dots, that means that they're going out of the page, right? So you can think about the arrow model, right? So you have that little cross or like the little, like, I don't know what to call it, those feathers at the end of the arrow, right? They look like a cross. So when you're, when an arrow is leaving you, you can see those little feathers and they'll look like a cross. So if they're leaving you, that you, you can imagine it going into the page, so you see like a cross. And if it's coming out of the page towards you, then you'll see the little point of the arrow, right? So you'll see dots. So that's the arrow, the arrow method. So yeah, dots out of the page, crosses into the page. All right, so let's look at this 2013 HSC example question now. So P, Q, R are straight current carrying conductors. Conductors P and R are fixed and unable to move. Conductor Q on the other hand is free to move. In what direction will conductor Q as, uh, move as a result of the current flow from conductors P and R? So if you think about this, right, we thought, or like, you know, we, we formulated earlier, or we found earlier that when they're in opposite directions, right, when the, so comparing Q and R now, when the current will travel in opposite directions, that we, there will be a repelling force. So R will induce a force to the left on Q. That's the only way it can be repelled from R, right? And we also found that if current carrying conductors travel in the same direction, so P and Q now, they will induce or they will result in the induction of um, an attractive force, right? So P wants Q to come to towards it and R wants Q to go away for it. So this kind of in, like indicates to us that Q, the direction will be to the left and both of them will be, will generate a force in the same direction, right? So. How we solve this question? Well, first we'll draw the dots and crosses and we'll calculate the direction the given conductor will move in. So drawing the dots and crosses now, we can see that R, right? R, if I if I do my right hand grip rule, it will produce um, uh, four fingers will go into the page and we have, so we have green crosses going into the page, green crosses going into the page. Whereas with P, we will have P again, sorry, again, it will go into the page. So we'll have pink crosses as well. So we have green crosses representative R and pink crosses representative of uh, of P. And so P and R will both indicate, will both result in magnetic fields going into the page. So we have dots, so we have crosses in both cases. You guys can ignore blue, but blue is representative of the magnetic field that Q would generate, but that's irrelevant in this case because P and R are stationary and Q can only induce forces on P and R. It can't induce forces on itself, right? But P and R can induce forces on Q because Q is free to move. So it, it will generate like motion. So in this case, both of them are into the page. So we see crosses from both P and R. So what is the force then on Y or Q? Well, to calculate the force, so this will be looking for like a numerical value, right? So to calculate this force then, we can use the formula that we went through a bit earlier. So this formula, F over L, right? So we have L, one meter, so it's pretty, um, and we have the, dis the distance, right? Five and 2.5, so we have R as well, and we have the currents as well, so we have I, A, I. This is a, um, a constant. This constant is given to you on your data sheet, mu naught. So yeah, knowing everything, we can now plug everything in now. So. Current flow in the same direction equals attract, in the opposite direction equals repel. So F over L is equal to mu naught over two pi times I1, I2 over R. Um, this, this constant is equal to two times 10 to the power of negative seven. It doesn't change because it's a constant. So now we can go ahead and calculate the force between PQ. PQ, we have two times 10 to the power of negative seven times six times two times one. This one comes from L, which is just one meter. Right, six times two comes from the currents, six and two. And then we divide it by five times 10 to the power of negative three because they're separated by five millimeters. And that yields us a force of 9.8 times 10 to the power of negative four newtons, or yeah, negative four newtons um, left. And then we can calculate the force between R and Q. So again, we have the constant two times 10 to the power of negative seven times two times two times one. We do two times two times one because Q has uh, a current of two and R is a current of two. 
So we have 2 times 2 times 1, and that is all divided by 2.5 or times 10 to the prime negative 3 because they are separated by 2.5 millimeters, and that yields us a force of 3.2 times 10 to the power of negative 4 newtons left. So because they're both left in this case, we can just add them together and we'll get a total force in Q of 8 times 10 to the negative 4 newtons left or towards P, whichever way you want to say it, but they will both indicate the same direction. So yeah, that's how you would solve those types of questions. Knowing that now we can move on to electromagnetic induction. So electromagnetic induction is when a conductor exposed to a change in flux induces an EMF, right? Uh, a conductor which is exposed to a change in flux induces an EMF. So then the key question is, what is flux? So flux is basically how many lines are going through an area. And flux density is how packed these things are. So flux can be the same. So in this case, right? In this case, flux is the same, you have four. Flux density, however, is not the same because the area has increased, whereas we still have four crosses. So flux is the same, whereas in this case, flux density is not the same. So that's something that you guys should keep in mind. So those two things can be different. So now we can, knowing this content, now we can move on to Faraday's and Lenz's law. So definitions, these two, are highly important and I would recommend that you guys know them by heart because um, I recommend that whenever you guys do a question that involves EMF or back EMF or something always write down Faraday's and Lenz's law so you can come back to them and refer to them when you're doing your explanations. So Faraday's law states that relative motion between a conductor and a magnetic field induces an EMF and Lenz's law states that this induced EMF will create a current in a closed circuit and generate a magnetic field that opposes the change in flux. So that's Faraday's law and Lenz's law. Lenz's law is like, um, it will generate a B field that opposes change in flux and Faraday's law basically says it will induce an EMF. So, all right, so let's look at the conservation of energy now. So what is the law of conservation of energy? Well, the law of conservation of energy basically states that energy cannot be created or destroyed it can only be transformed from one form to another. So it can only be transformed or transferred. So DC motor example then. DC motors, they produce back EMF. Back EMF opposes the supply EMF, right? Why doesn't it um, support the supply EMF? Well, if it did end up supporting the supply EMF, then that would mean that um, we'd have more current, more torque, and so the rotor would spin faster and then the coil will increase experiences a greater change in flux and so we'll have more induced current more torque more and they will just keep repeating and then one left just getting infinite energy like if it did support the change right all i'd have to do is just like to power this like nuclear plant motor i just have to plug in like one double a battery and eventually the motor will start spinning and supplying its own like emf right that obviously violates the law of conservation of energy because it kind of indicates that we are creating energy when energy cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed or transferred from one form to another. So back EMF is like an opposing force to supply EMF, always opposes. So let's go through a recap of solenoids now. So fingers point in the direction of the current, the thumb point in the direction of the North Pole. So if your solenoid is in this case, right? If your solenoid is pointing upwards, your fingers will point upwards, like they will curve along with the direction of the solenoid and then whichever direction your thumb points in will be north. So yeah, little recap of solenoids. We can move on to the definition of eddy currents now. So eddy currents, what are they? Well, eddy currents are circular induced currents set up when bulk pieces of metal experience a change in flux. How would you determine the direction of these eddy currents? Well, these eddy currents will act to oppose the initial change in, uh, in flux following Lenz's law. So if you look at this example, right, I have a North Pole and let's say I have a sheet of metal, right? So let's explain its, its motion is moving this way. So let's say it's moving right, right? Right, so if it's moving right, right, that means that, um, so we have magnetic fields going downwards right? If it's moving right, that means that this part of the metal, right, this like small section of this metal, right, is 
experiencing a change in magnetic flux. What does that change? That change is that it's going to go from experiencing a magnetic field to not experiencing a magnetic field, right? So it's the, the field lines going into the page are decreasing, right? So what it wants to do is it wants to supplement this. It wants to oppose this feature, right? It wants to oppose this change, resist this change by basically supplementing it by providing its own magnetic field lines downwards. And that will kind of resist the change and make it harder for us to pull the sheet out. How will it do that? Well, it can generate a current circulating in this direction, right? To count, and that will generate a magnetic field line slash um, magnetic field basically going downwards, right? Via the grip rule, generate a magnetic field going downwards, right? So it kind of supplements that force. Sorry, it supplements the change in magnetic flux, right? It opposes the change in magnetic flux. It opposes the change that it's experiencing, right? With the changes, it's lowering in the amount of magnetic field lines cutting through it. So then to oppose that change, it will kind of induce its own magnetic field in that same direction, right? And then let's look at the other side. So the other side is going from having no magnetic field to then all of a sudden being dragged into a magnetic field. So then this other side will try to oppose its change in the opposite, like in an opposite way. So it will try to minimize the impact that this magnetic field lines will have on it by generating a mag or inducing a magnetic field that goes in the opposite direction to counteract the magnetic field from this North Pole, right? Because it initially didn't have any magnetic fields. And so it doesn't want to change. It wants to oppose the change. And so in this case, it will generate an eddy current going in the opposite direction to generate a magnetic field upwards. So the basis of everything is it will always try to oppose the change. So in the big, in this side, it doesn't want to leave the magnetic field because it was initially in the magnetic field. And so it will generate a current in this particular manner. Whereas on the other side, it wasn't initially in a magnetic field, but now it's being dragged into a magnetic field as the sheet of metal is being dragged along. And so it wants to resist this change by inducing a magnetic field in the opposite direction. So any currents will always induce magnetic fields, but its direction is determined by does it want, like, is it losing out on an, a pre-existing magnetic field or is it being introduced to an existing magnetic field? So that's what determines or differentiates between the different directions. That's what we can use to determine the two different directions. All right, so let's look at this question now. What direction is the current induced in the ring as the magnetic field is turned off? So let's see what happens when the magnetic field is turned off, right? What will happen is we will initially, so within within this magnetic field itself, right? We initially have magnetic field lines cutting across it going into the page, right? Because we see crosses into the page. And then all of a sudden we turn it off. So all of a sudden it's it already had magnetic fields going into the page and now it doesn't, right? So it, it wants to oppose the change by like, by having its own magnetic field going into the page. So it can feel like it already, it can feel like it was in its magnetic field originally, if that makes sense. So originally it had, it was already in a magnetic field. We turned it off. So that was the change. We removed the magnetic field. It's going to try opposing that change by inducing a similar magnetic field in the same direction. So this one will try and induce a magnetic field in the same direction by going into the page, right? So it will induce a magnetic field going into the page. To generate that, I will point my thumb into the page and I will see in which direction my fingers turn. My fingers turn clockwise. And so I will generate or I will induce a current in the clockwise direction. And this will induce a magnetic field going into the page, which will be the way of opposing the change that it's experiencing, if that makes sense. So that is that particular example right there. We can now move on to electromagnetic breaking, which is uh, an application of our understanding of electromagnetic, uh, sorry, electromagnetic breaking, which is an application of our understanding of eddy currents. So this is kind of what it will look like in, in a car or a train or wherever electromagnetic breaking is used, right? So, um, yeah, so we have an electromagnet that can be turned on or, torn, or turned on or turned off. And when we want to break, we'll turn the electromagnet on and we will kind of induce this um, magnetic field on it. This will generate eddy currents, right? And so those eddy currents will try and oppose the, the change in magnetic flux. And what ends up happening is it will end up, um, it will end up generating 
a force that will oppose the cha the change in motion that we're doing. So because the magnetic field will oppose the direction will oppose the change that we're doing, the force generated will also oppose what we're doing. So if we're trying to turn it if we're trying to turn it this way, it will kind of slow it down because the force generated will be resistive. So they will change they will turn in different directions, right? Because that's a, so so in this direction, right? If we're looking on this facing on the side facing towards us, right? Let's assume the magnetic foot is coming out of the page, right? If we're turning the wheel um, anti-clockwise, then this side, like this side of the of the wheel, right, will be leaving the magnetic field. It doesn't want to leave the magnetic field, right? So it wants to oppose this change by inducing its own magnetic field in the same direction. So it will induce a magnetic field, right? That will go, it will induce an eddy current going anti-clockwise that will induce a magnetic field going out of the page. So the eddy currents on this side of the wheel, on the left-hand side of the wheel, will be turning anti-clockwise. If we look at the right-hand side of the wheel now, this part of the wheel now is being, as it's turning, right, it's being introduced into the magnetic field. That's also a change. It doesn't want to be introduced into magnetic field because that will change magnetic flux, right? It doesn't want to change. It wants to oppose the change. So to oppose the change, it will try to generate a magnetic field in the opposite direction to kind of counteract it or to balance it out. Right, so it will now, uh, it will now turn clockwise. Right, it will turn clockwise to generate a magnetic field in to generate a magnetic field into the page. Right, because it's being introduced into a magnetic field coming out of the page. So it will generate a magnetic field going into the page in the same in the opposite direction. Sorry, and so eddy currents on the right hand side of the wheel will turn clockwise, whereas eddy currents on the left hand side of the wheel will turn anti clockwise. So yeah, that is um, eddy currents. All right, so now, uh, yeah, so how it works basically is we have a change in EMF and then we res it results in an induced back EMF and then the speed decreases because there's a force applied. In terms of electromagnetic braking itself, there are a couple advantages to normal braking. Electromagnetic braking can also be called regenerative braking as well because we can use this induced back EMF to kind of charge the battery in the car, if that makes sense as well. So, or we can use the eddy currents to charge the battery. So, um, let's think about the way um, electro or advantages and disadvantages of electromagnetic braking. So, if you look at this picture, right, as you can see, the electromagnet isn't touching the wheel. The wheel isn't touching the electromagnet. It's just basically the wheel by itself, right? So. Electromagnetic braking doesn't require any parts in contact, right? It doesn't require any parts in contact. The electromagnet can be stationary. The wheel can be the only thing moving. And that is an advantage because you won't like, you won't damage things based on them being in contact and rubbing against each other and like, and like becoming loose and stuff. You won't have that. But then a disadvantage is, um, oh yeah. And another advantage is in terms of sound, I guess you won't, you won't like with trains braking and stuff, you'll hear a lot of sound and stuff, but um, of the moving parts, right? In this case, you won't. Um, but a disadvantage at the same time is you'll generate a lot of heat, right? Eddy currents cause energy loss due to heat, right? And so there will be a lot of heat produced depending on the scenario. So if it's trains, right, they're very heavy and there's lots of brakes on it, it will generate a lot, a lot of heat. And that could themselves wear down the, the materials. So it is an advantage and there is a, it's also a disadvantage compared to normal braking that we have. All right. Now let's look at transformers. So what is a transformer? Well, a transformer is a device that increases or decreases the voltage of an alternating current. It has to be alternating current because transformers need a change in magnetic flux to do what it does. So... Uh, it either increases, steps up, or decreases the voltage of uh, a, an AC current. So we have a first coil and we have a second coil, and it's, there's basically magnetic induction is what occurs. So we transfer, we induce a voltage in the second coil from the first coil. And this can be better done through a core, but in this case, this transformer doesn't have a core. So there are a couple of things that affect, um, that affect the efficiency of a transformer couple of things. So first of all, we have eddy currents. And as I mentioned before, right, eddy currents cause energy loss due to heat. 
And so these transformers could have very low efficiency due to energy loss due to heat. Energy loss due to heat. Um, we also have flux leakage. Um, yeah, so flux leakage is where like the magnetic flux isn't fully transferred from the primary coil into the secondary coil. Um, yeah, that also leads to uh, changes in efficiency because we're not fully transforming or we're not fully yeah, yeah, transforming the energy from the primary coil into the secondary coil. Some of it's lost, right? So that also affects efficiency. In terms of what we can do to um, improve these types of efficiencies, well, with eddy currents, what we can do is we can laminate the core. Laminating the core with, um, so, this is an so this is an example of um, eddy currents uh, by themselves in a non-laminated core. And this is an example of a laminated core. As you can see, the size of eddy currents are a lot smaller. And so because of that, the, the heat loss or the energy loss due to heat that they will um, they will cause is a lot less. So laminating the core is a good way of mitigating this issue. In terms of flux leakage, couple of things that you can do, right? Obviously, if I had a core, there will be a lot less flux leakage. As you can see, the, the lines are a lot more aligned, right? The magnetic flux, as opposed to without a core. So obviously, the first thing that I would do is have a, like a, a core, right? Have a core and also make sure that this core is made out of ferrite. Right, ferrites are things that are electrically that are electrically non-conductive but magnetically inductive, which means that they won't uh, they won't or they will minimize the formation of eddy currents, right? Minimize the formation of eddy currents because they're not very electrically conductive, but they will be very magnetically conductive, and so you have very little flux leakage because they'll be very conductive to magnets essentially. So yeah, that's that. Um, so yeah, note that the equation VP VI equals VS VI assumes perfect efficiency, right? If you don't have perfect efficiency, then VP VI will be equal to like, say you have 90% efficiency, then VP VI, right? The power in the primary coil will be equal to the like 0 0.9 times the power in the secondary coil. If you have 90% efficiency, so VP VI or VP IP is equal to 0 0.9 VS IS. All right, so let's look at now an AC induction motor. So this is also like a, a complex area of module six, I could say. So an AC induction motor consists of a squirrel cage rotor, three sets of stator magnets at 120 degrees from one another and an axle. So this is kind of what it looks like, right? First phase, second phase, third phase. Um, yeah, they have three phases. If you look at in the, like factories and stuff, they often um, target three or they often intake three phases. Households and general stuff like that, um, they we only intake one phase. Um, but yeah, AC induction motor, right? How it works is the three phase AC current creates a rotating magnetic field. So we induce a magnetic field here, then here, then here. So it kind of induces or creates a rotating magnetic field, right? And this rotating magnetic field will cause the, f the, the field lines to cut through the squirrel cage rotor. And so there will be, so there will be cutting of magnetic field lines. And so we can say that um, there will be the squirrel cage rotor will experience a change in flux, right? So to minimize this change in flux, it will try and rotate in the same direction as the rotating magnetic field to basically try to minimize the, the cutting of magnetic field lines, as it says. So, so if the magnetic field lines rotate in this direction, then to minimize the change or in magnetic flux that the squirrel cage rotor will experience, it will also turn in that same direction, right? Uh, but it will never catch up because if, it ne if, because if the squirrel cage rotor catches up, that basically means that the squirrel cage rotor has 100% eliminated the, the input energy that we put in to rotate the magnetic field. And that also violates the law of conservation of energy, right? So the squirrel cage rotor will always be a little bit slower than the rotation of the magnetic field or the rotation speed of, magne of the magnetic field, of the magnetic field, sorry. And therefore, um, there will, the squirrel cage rotor will always experience a change in magnetic flux. And because it will always experience a change in magnetic flux, it will always keep rotating, assuming we keep the magnetic field on. And so the difference between 
uh, the rotational velocity of the magnetic field and the rotational velocity of the squirrel cage rotor is referred to as slip speed. So that might be some, uh, if you see that word in, uh, in one of your exams, that is what it means, slip speed. All right, so let's look at applications of the motor effect now. So what applications to the motor effect are very evident in Moses, right? Essentially, we're placing a coil in a magnetic field, and as we pass a current through it, we, it causes it to turn, and we can use the right-hand rule to figure out the direction of motion, right? So the important thing with motors is you need to differentiate between slip rings and split ring commutators, right? So AC uses slip rings because AC current is already alternating, so we only need these slip rings to ensure that the coil is always connected to the circuit. So these are the slip rings. And with DC, however, we use split rings as well. Split rings make sure that we uh, um, we change the direction of current every half turn to keep the motor moving in the same direction. So we can say to preserve unidirectional torque, split ring commutators um, change the direction of the current in the coil every half turn to preserve unidirectional torque, which means torque in one direction or one direction of rotation. So yeah. And these are the split ring commutators in a DC motor. Always remember DC motor, split ring commutator, AC motor, slip rings, because slip rings don't alternate the direction of current because AC current is already alternating. So yeah, we also have now generators, which kind of do the opposite of, of motors, right? Motors, we input energy to cause it to turn. Generators, we turn it to generate energy. So, yeah, it's basically like a reversed motor. So same kind of setup, except we do, we supply an external force to turn the coil and that will generate an induced EMF, an induced current. And that induced current is what we're harnessing to generate energy, basically. And examples of these include wind turbine blades, wind turbine blades, and also like steam, like steam powered, like factory blades and stuff as well. All right, so that then uh, takes us to the end of module six. So we've looked at electromagnetism, we've looked at um, uh, motors, transformers, um, uh, torque. Uh, uh, yeah, like um, I think that's basically it that we need to cover in module six. So yeah, uh, general overview of module six, kind of the, the stuff that you might need to know in terms of like general points that you might need to know or touch up on for module six. Um, we can now move on to module seven. So disclaimer is module seven is very content heavy. So compared to module six, at least we'll get to module eight later on, right? Um, or you find out later on in the year that module eight is way more content heavy than all of the modules. But so far module seven out of everything that we've encountered will be the most content heavy. So going through module seven, then we'll first look at the historical methods for calculating the speed of light. So we have Galileo, first of all. So what did Galileo do? Um, he basically, uh, he just took like him and some other dude. Let's let's say person A and person B, right? Person A climbed up to mountain A and person B climbed up to mountain B. That was approximately, I don't know, like one to two to three kilometers away from mountain A, right? So person A now had a timer and a lamp. Person B had a timer and a lamp as well. Uh, person B only had a time, only had a lamp, sorry. So what person A did was person A, um, person A turned on his lamp and timer at the same time, right? And he waited until the light ray traveled all the way to person B on top of mountain B. And then once the, once person B saw the light turn on, he himself would also turn on his lamp. And so then person A could also see the light turn on. So once person A saw person B's lamp turn on, that means that light would have traveled from his lamp all the way to person B, and then light would have traveled from person B's lamp all the way to person A. And so then he would stop the timer. And so assuming that the mountain was three kilometers distance, he would technically find the time taken for light to travel six kilometers, right? Because light would travel from person A to person B and then from person B to person A. There's one issue with that, or two issues with that though. First of all, if you look at the speed of light, right? The speed of light is is massive, like, like or not massive. It's it's a very very large value, and so the the time. Well, in fact, um, it can travel around the Earth seven times in one second, 
And so the time it would take to travel six kilometers in this case will be very, very little. And it's not like Galileo could stand like 40, 50 kilometers away because then he wouldn't be able to see the other person because of Earth's rotation or Earth's like curvature, right? And so the time was very, very insignificant. And then you have to take into consideration human reaction time, right? Because person B had to see the light turn on from person A and then turn on his own light for person A to record the time, right? And so the time taken for person B to turn on his lamp would be so, so much higher than the time taken for light to travel between the two mountains. And so there would be a very, very large percentage error. And you can see that because Galileo kind of ended up saying that light would be, I don't know, like around 10 times the speed of sound. So that's kind of what Galileo got. It was very inaccurate, but it was kind of at his time, the only way of solving this, um, this or like calculating the speed of light in this case. And then we have Old Roma. So what Old Roma did was he used the revolution speed of Io. So he found that the revolution speed of Io changed during different times of year due to differing distances between Earth and Jupiter. And by doing that, he was able to calculate the speed of light. And he said it was around 2.1 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. So he used differing um, revolutionary speeds of Jupiter's moon Io. And his one was a lot more accurate than Galileo. And then we have James Bradley. So James Bradley, he observed stellar aberration, which is basically the changing positions of stars in the sky. Um, using this, he was able to get pretty close. Um, so he was able to get what we use as speed of sound, a speed of light right now. He got three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second, like around there. So that was very accurate, right? So we, we've significantly increased in accuracy moving up now. So after James Bradley now, we have Fitzo, Hippolyte Fitzo, right? He used the rotating tooth wheel um, contraption that you can see a diagram that I've drawn off, right? Um, so he's used he's using the rotating tooth wheel contraption. He's shown light through a gap, which is reflected back by a mirror very far away. So the light would shine through a gap in these cog wheels, right? And it would be reflected from a mirror very far away, coming back, right? And he changed the speed of rotation until the reflected light couldn't be seen. What does that mean? Well, it means that after the light having traveled twice that far distance, it would travel past the cogwheel to this mirror really far away. As it was coming back, it the cogwheel would have moved enough so that instead of light passing through a gap now, it would pass through the adjacent cogwheel. So initially, light would pass through a gap between the cogs, right? And so he would turn it enough, so he would turn the wheel fast enough so that when light came back, it would hit this cog adjacent to it, and therefore light would be blocked out. So he would increase the rotation, the rotational speed and keep increasing it until the reflected light ray couldn't be seen. And that's, and that's what, that's the method that he kind of used. And using this method, he was able to get around 3.1 times 10 to the power of eight meters per second. So very accurate as well. Um, then we have Foucault, right? So Foucault, he used a rotating mirror contraption where he reflected light to a stationary mirror so that by the time the reflected light came back, the mirror would have rotated and the angle between the light source and the reflected angle would be measured to calculate C. So if you look at this, right? Um, so you have a light source, it gets shot, it gets shot, uh, reflected to a stationary mirror. As it's, as it's being reflected to the stationary mirror and coming back, the rotating mirror will have rotated a very tiny bit and that will cause this reflected light ray to be like deflected a little bit Right, and so we'd be seeing the deflected light ray, and we by knowing this angle or the deflection angle, we'd be able to calculate the speed of light. So, what's important here is, um, what's important here is you guys need to know at least I would recommend knowing around three to four very detailed um historical methods for calculating the speed of light because they could they it's a very high possibility that they will be tested right, either in your school or in the HSC or in trials. So I'd recommend knowing Fitzo, knowing how to draw this diagram, always draw diagrams, by the way, whenever you come to like four or five, even like maybe not one, maybe not three more questions, but even in some cases, three more questions, I would recommend drawing diagrams, right? But definitely for these types of like method questions, right, always draw diagrams. So if you're talking about Fitzo, always draw a diagram. Even Galileo, just draw like two mountains and two stick figures standing on top of the two mountains. It really helps boost your, um, your responses. So like uh, have a diagram or like have a sample diagram that you uh, draw back on when you look at Fitzo and Foucault's experiment 
it's kind of hard to do that with all Roma and Bradley. But yeah, I'd recommend knowing Fitzo. I'd recommend knowing Foucault. The other three, right? Um, Galileo, very simple. So you can always have Galileo in the back of your mind. If you forget one thing, it's like a backup. And then you can pick between all Roma and James Bradley, whichever one you want to look at next. So yeah, those are the historical methods for calculating the speed of light. With that now, we can move on to the electromagnetic spectrum and question, what is light? So we know light is an electromagnetic wave, but then what exactly is an electromagnetic wave? Well, an electromagnetic wave is a wave consisting of electric and magnetic fields oscillating at right angles to each other, which can self-propagate through empty space. So the important things in this case is that an electromagnetic wave consists of both electric and magnetic fields, and these electric and magnetic fields oscillate at right angles to one another, and they can self-propagate through empty space. So they don't, they don't need a medium, and they can propagate themselves. So let's unpack what we mean by self-propagate. So I briefly brought this up when we are looking at module 6, but we'll look at it in more detail now. So Maxwell's two, four equations, sorry. So he basically said that a point charge produces an electric field. That's Gauss's law. An accelerating point charge produces a changing electric field, also Gauss's law. Uh, and a changing electric field produces a changing magnetic field. A changing magnetic field produces a changing electric field. And these last two steps repeat one on one. So a changing magnetic field will produce a changing magnetic field, which will then produce a changing electric field, which will then produce a changing magnetic field, so on and so on and so on. And that is what we mean by self-propagation. So um, if you look at this now, an accelerating point charge produces a changing electric field, right? Via Gauss's law. That would mean that if an electron is accelerating, it will produce a changing electric field, which will produce a changing magnetic field, which will change a changing electric field, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that would indicate that accelerating point charges will emit electromagnetic radiation. Keep that in mind because that might be, um, that info might not be very useful now, but it definitely will be useful in module eight. Accelerating charges via Maxwell's four equations produce EM radiation. Um, in terms of these laws, you won't need to know any equations. There are equations for these laws, but you won't need to know any equations. It's also unlikely that they will spe specify Ampere's law and Faraday's law. Just know his four equations. And let's look at where Maxwell comes into play. So basically what he did was he put together the four equations to unify electricity and magnetism for the first time. So basically he predicted the existence of EM waves he rearranged the equations to predict that EM waves should travel at a speed given by this, right? And because this, this constant speed was very similar to, at the current time, the known values for the speed of light, he predicted that light was an EM wave as well. He wasn't able to verify anything. He wasn't able to like mathematically, or he was able to mathematically suggest, but he wasn't able to experimentally verify anything. So he's able to predict the existence of EM waves and he predicted that EM waves should travel at that speed. And then he predicted that light was an EM wave. So, yeah, he also described electromagnetic waves as self-propagating waves with electric and magnetic fields oscillating at right angles to one another. All right, so why is this all important then? Well, his proposal one is that light is an electromagnetic wave, as I mentioned before, and his proposal two is life is, is light is a self-sustaining mutual generation of magnetic and electric fields, and hence electromagnetic. So the implication of this is that light is just one part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. We know now that the EM spectrum has like X-rays, um, gamma rays, microwaves, infrared radiation, uh, ultraviolet, X and like a whole bunch of things, right? So we know now that light is just one part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, but Maxwell's proposals to led to this implication that light is simply one part of the entire EM spectrum. All right, let's look at the wave model now. Once we go through all the content, I'll go through a quick summary before we enter special relativity, and that will kind of draw together everything that we've learned. So it'll be a bit easier for you guys to think about what we learned and, and hold that in your memory. So the wave model. So what evidence supports the classical wave model of light and what predictions can be made using this model? All right, so first let's go through wave properties before we go through this. So diffraction, what is diffraction? 
Diffraction is the bending or dispersion of light around corners or narrow gaps. And it's noticeable when the slit is near the size of the wave's wavelength. And diffraction patterns are created through the constructive and destructive interference of two or more waves. That is kind of foreshadowing into what we're going to look at later. So let's look at Young's double slit experiment then. So oh, one other thing that we'll go through is interference. Like wave interference is another property. Waves can undergo constructive interference or destructive interference, depending on whether the wave's wavelengths are in phase or out of phase. If they're in phase, that means that the troughs and the crests align between the two waves. So the troughs will align with the troughs and the crests will align with the crests. So they're kind of in phase, right? And so the amplitudes will be added. Whereas if they're out of phase, one wave's troughs will align with another wave's crests. So there'll be like, there'll be one wavelength, there'll be half a wavelength apart or a multiple of a half a wavelength apart, right? And that will cause their amplitudes to be subtracted from one another. So that's destructive interference. So uh, Young's double slit, what is Young's double slit experiment then? His experiment basically showed that waves can diffract, interfere and create interference patterns. He determined, so to determine where the interference bright and spots and dark spots are, um, bright spots can be can be given by d sine theta is equal to m lambda, where d is equal to the width of the slits, m is equal to any integer value, and lambda is equal to the wavelength of the wave. And dark spots can be given by d sine theta is equal to m plus half lambda or m minus half lambda, whichever one you do. So the significance on the difference between the two formulas comes from m, right? So m must bear some significance. Well, it does. So M is representative of how far out of phase or how much in phase they are. So it, if M is an integer value, that means that the two waves are an integer value wavelengths apart from one another. That means that they're always in phase because if the wavelengths are one wavelength apart from one another, the crests will still align with the crests and the troughs will still align with the troughs between the two waves. Same applies if the wavelength difference is two wavelengths, three wavelengths, four wavelengths, five wavelengths, any integer value. Whereas if it's an if it's a multiple of a half, right? So sorry, not a multiple of a half, but if it's like something 0.5, right? So m plus half, right? So if it's 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, that means that it will always be around half a wavelength out of phase. Right? That means that the wave that means that within the waves, the crests will align with the troughs and the troughs will align with the crests. So it will be like mismatched, exactly. And because of that, the amplitudes will subtract from one another. So that's destructive interference. That's why we do M plus half. And that's why M minus half also works because all we needed to do is we needed to be something half, right? So we have this zero point that's called the central maxima, the brightest bright spot, because that's equidistant from these two slits. And so the waves originating from these two slits will travel the same distance to get to this central point. If they travel the same distance, they will be in phase. So yeah, that's the central maxima. And then we have the first maxima, second maxima, third maxima, fourth maxima, so on and so forth. We have the first minima, first dark band, uh, second minima, third minima, fourth minima, first minima, second minima, third minima, fourth minima, same thing applies to maxima as well. All right, so the interference pattern on the screen is caused by the different distances traveled by the light to each point on the screen. So if it's the same difference, the same distance traveled, sorry, then the waves still are in phase. And therefore, if they're in phase, they will undergo constructive interference. And so we'll see a bright spot on the screen because we're ending up, we're basically adding the amplitudes. The waves can also travel an extra one lambda wavelengths, right? So if wave two now travels an extra one lambda wavelength to get to that position compared to wave one, they're still considered in phase. So we'll still undergo constructive interference and we'll still see a bright spot on the screen. That's why we say an integer multiple of wavelength. So we can still see a bright spot on the screen. However, if wave two travels half a wavelength um, extra, Right? or if, if one of the wavelengths travel half a wavelength extra, then the waves are considered out of phase. You can see here how the, 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 the troughs align with the crests, right? They're out of phase, and so we'll undergo destructive interference. That's why it doesn't matter if they're 
2.5 wavelengths out of phase or 155.5 wavelengths out of phase as long as it's not an integer value as long as it's like a, a non-integer multiple of a half the waves will be out of phase and so destructive interference will occur and will and because of destructive interference the amplitudes will subtract from one another and so we'll see a dark spot on the screen if that makes sense so that is diffraction interference. So that's Young's double slit experiment. Let's look at polarization now. So light can be polarized and unpolarized. In its unpolarized form, EM waves can have their electric and magnetic field oscillate in any direction. As you can see in unpolarized light, they can oscillate in any direction, right? Any, any field or any plane it can in, oscillate in. Polarized light, however, is when the direction of oscillation is restricted to a single direction. So it's when, when the oscillation is restricted to a single direction. So to convert from unpolarized to polarized light, I is equal to 0 0.5 IO. So if I'm calculating the intensity of, uh, of so let's say, let's say unpolarized light of intensity 10 is passed through a polarizing filter. What is, the, what is the intensity of light coming out of the polarizing filter? Well, the intensity of light going into the polarizing filter is 10. The intensity of the polarized light going out of the filter will be 5 because it will be half of the original value. This is not the same if the light is already polarized. If the light is already polarized, then the direction of oscillation is already restricted, right? And so, like since the direction of restriction will already be restricted, there will only be very little components of that direction that will be able to pass through the, the slit or, the, or the, the polarizing filter, right? So in this case, I is equal to I naught cos squared theta. So the difference in, in direction between the polarized light ray and the filter is let's say 30 degrees, then the intensity of the already polarized light passing through the filter will be I is equal to I naught cos squared 30. So that's how we would uh, employ that formula. So let's go through a question now. Worth three marks, unpolarized light enters a vertically aligned polarization filter. Then it passes through a horizontally aligned filter. So it's polarized twice, All right? That's the important thing. So tip seven, don't jump to conclusions, always read the question properly. So it's polarized twice. Once it's unpolarized light, then the polarized light gets polarized again. What fraction of the original intensity of light passes through the horizontal filter. What fraction of the original intensity of light passes through the horizontal filter? So then part B asks, another filter aligned 60 degrees to the vertical is placed between the vertical and horizontal filters. Calculate the fraction of light's original intensity that now passes through the horizontal filter. So we'll do part A first. So part A. I is equal to 0 0.5 times I naught, right? That's because we initially have unpolarized light. So we have half. And then I is equal to I naught cos squared 90 because initial, so after it's passing through the vertically aligned polarizing filter, the direction of polarization will be vertical. And then it will pass through a horizontally aligned filter. So then it will be 90 degrees, right? If you think about it, no component, not like the horizontal filter is perpendicular to the vertical filter. And so no component in the direction of oscillation of light can, is, is horizontal in a vertically aligned polarizing filter, right? Because it will, be nine, it will be fully perpendicular, 90 degrees, right? And this is represented or this is in, indicated in the formula as well. So we have 0 0.5 times I naught, so we're half. And then we have the secondary formula, half times cos squared 90, because we're multiplying this, this half along with it to find the final fraction. The final fraction will be zero. So no intensity of light will pass through the horizontal filter. Reason being is no component of that light that of the polarized light will oscillate in the direction of the horizontal filter. So now we have an additional question. So if another filter is now put between the horizontal and vertical filter, so now we have three filters, right? So one is the vertical, then the 60 degrees, then the horizontal. Now they want us to calculate the fraction of the light's original intensity that passed through the horizontal filter. So let's do that now. So part B, we still have to start with 0 0.5 times I naught, which is equal to half, right? And we have half times cos squared 60 because now it doesn't pass through the horizontal filter first. It passes through the thing aligned at 60 degrees, 
In this case, there is a component, we can say there's a component of the vertically aligned um, um, light ray that oscillates in the direction of that is 60 degrees to it, right? So we can do half times cos squared 60 and we'll get a fraction value of uh, 0 0.125. So then we can multiply the 0 0.125 by 30 degrees because if the filter is, is uh, aligned at 60 degrees to vertical, then it's only 30 degrees away from horizontal, right? 90 degrees, 60, 30. So we can now do 30 degrees because this light ray now is oscillating at 60 degrees to the vertical. And so the light ray coming out of the secondary filter is only 30 degrees away from the horizontal filter. And so it's leaving the it's leaving this now at 0 0.125 times cos squared 30, and that will be equal to three over 32. So that is the answer to that question. You just have to repeat the steps and make sure that you read the question so you know how many filters it passes through and whether the light passing through these filters are polarized or unpolarized. And that's the important part. All right, so let's look at the quantum model of light now. So the inquiry question in this case is what evidence supports the particle model of light and what are the implications of this evidence for the development of the quantum model of light? All right, so let's look at the content for this now. So black body radiation. So what is black body radiation? It's essentially, well, let's go through the content. So Planck proposed that EM radiation could only be emitted in discrete packages called quanta. So, okay, so black body radiation is kind of like the radiation emitted by a perfect black body or a perfect absorber of all radiation, right? So um, classical theory indicated, right, that as um, we decrease wavelength or as we increase frequency, um, the energy carried by EM waves would increase exponentially. So as we decrease frequency, the intensity would increase exponentially. This was, um, so as we increase frequency, intensity would increase proportionally or exponentially along with it. This violated the law of conservation of energy because it suggested that as we had a lower and lower and lower wavelength and therefore frequency increases and increases and increases because light has a constant velocity. As we have a lower and lower and lower wavelength, this indicates that the radiance or the or the or the energy carried by that light would approach infinity. We can't have infinite energy. That violates the law of conservation of energy. And this is what we refer to as the ultraviolet catastrophe. So to solve this ultraviolet catastrophe, Planck proposed a mathematical trick, right? He believed this was a mathematical trick. He believed he didn't believe that this was a proper solution. He treated it like a mathematical trick. He basically proposed this mathematical trick saying that EM radiation could only be emitted in discrete packages called quanta. So, electro, so energy was emitted in discrete packages called quanta. And each quanta has energy E equals HF. Using this now, he was able to kind of change or map the classical theory, like the, the, energy, the line from classical theory, this black line, to match our observed um, graphs for for a perfect black body or observed graphs from suns, which in this case we consider as being a perfect black body. And the way he did that was he kind of considered like the probability of uh, of an energy packet being emitted. So if you think about it, right, at this stage, right, the wavelength is really low, so frequency is really high. And so at, at wavelengths approaching zero, each quanta would have an energy approaching infinity, right? So each packet would have energy approaching infinity this is um like again this is like very unlikely to happen because uh infinite energy is impossible right so at this zero value the probability of it being of a quanta of energy containing zero infinite energy is zero right so we have a probability of zero and this exponentially increases as we reach 5000 kelvin because a quanta of energy containing and a quanta of energy containing energy equivalent to 5000 kelvin is the most likely to be released. And so it, it will be the highest at 5,000 Kelvin. And then it's promptly decreases because the energy within each quanta also decreases. And so the probability of releasing a quanta of that low energy is quite low in itself. So it promptly decreases afterwards. But yeah, he kind of did that by mapping probability of each quanta being released. But yeah, that's black body radiation. Um, so yeah, remember how accelerating charges create EM radiation? Uh, well, energy is emitted or absorbed when electrons jump between energy levels. Electrons jump up when given energy and jump down when they release energy. This is very uh, relevant in module eight. 
right? So note the graph drops to zero on the left. I mentioned that the graph drops to zero because, well, if you think about the way Planck mapped it using probability, the probability of a quanta containing infinite energy being released is zero. So yeah. Um, but yeah, that's black body radiation. Now we can look at um, spectral analysis, right? That's another uh, important area where you can be tested on. So what can the spectra of a mass uh, slash star tell us? We can tell us a couple of things. Temperature, rotational plus translational velocity, density, and composition. So question then. So in terms of temperature, so the temperature we have, Wien's law, rotational and translational velocity, right? So rotational, uh, sorry, we look at translational velocity first, right? If a star is moving away from us, right, that means that we can, we'll observe the Doppler shift or the Doppler effect on that specific star when we look at its spectra, right? So if a star is moving away from us, the wavelength of the light emitted will be stretched out, and so it will appear red shifted, right? Whereas if a star is moving towards us, Right, if, the, if a star is moving towards us, that means that the light wave will be more compressed and so it will appear blue shifted. So using that, we can tell if a star is moving away from us or, or um, towards us. With rotational velocity, if a star is rotating, right? If a star is rotating, then one side of the star is going to appear moving towards us and the other side of the star is going to be moving away from us, right? Because it's rotating. And so the side of the star that's going to be moving towards us will appear um, blue shifted whereas the side of the star that's moving away from us will appear red shifted. And so there will be both blue shifting and red shifting. And so the, what will end up happening is that the, the, the lines, the spectral lines will, will appear broadened. That's the evidence of rotational velocity. And then we have density as well. So density, it will also create broader and more denser, um, dense, uh, broader and more denser uh, spectral lines. But the difference with density is you will observe what we call pressure broadening. And so um, be, like, due to pressure broadening, the spectral, the spectra of the star itself will appear blurrier. So that's one way of differentiating between rotational velocity and density because rotational velocity leads to broader spectral lines. Same with density. However, however with density, the spectra will appear blurrier compared to rotational velocity. So that's one key differentiator. And then the other thing is composition because uh, every element will have a unique, like, um, unique spectral lines, right? And so whichever elements the star is composed of, it will have its own unique pattern based on what elements the star is co uh, composed of. And so we can use, com we can like calculate the composition of the star using known patterns that we can create in a lab, right? We can observe the spectral lines emitted by hydrogen. And if those, if that pattern is evident in the spectra of a star, we can say that hydrogen like the star is composed of hydrogen. So yeah, that is the an analyzing spectra component of stars. So let's do a question now. Question is, find the temperature of a star that has a peak frequency of 5.98 times 10 to the power of 14 hertz. So first we look at the, we write down the formula, right? Lambda max is equal to B over T. Um, in this case, we're not looking for lambda max, we're looking for temperature and we're given frequency. So we have to do a little bit of rearranging and reformulating. So C emitted, right? The light wave emitted is equal to F times lambda max. So we can rearrange this now by saying lambda max is equal to C over F. And then we can let these two equal to one another because we have C, that's a known value, three times 10 to the power of eight. We have F 5.98 times 10 to the power of 14. And we're trying to solve T. Right, so C divided by F is equal to B divided by T. And then T then is equal to BF over C. And knowing that now I can sub my values in. So as you can see over here, I also waited to sub my values in, right? So knowing this now I can sub my values in, T is equal to BF over C. I can do 2.898 times 10 to the power of negative three times 5.98 times 10 to the power of 14 divided by three times 10 to the power of eight. And that will give me my value for temperature which is equal to 5.77668 dot 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 times 10 to the power of 3 or 5.78 times 10 to the power of 3 Kelvin. So yeah, that's the value for temperature. Um, all right. So this is what I was looking for. This, this is a summary of the light model. So we have, um, let's go through this. So I like to look at the models as a story in time, basically. So, um, so there's different models, right? In terms of models, 
to move. So models have to be good at explaining current phenomena and really good models will be able to use them to predict future um, phenomena as well. And to move from one model to another model, there has to be experimental evidence that disproves our current understanding. If experimental evidence comes out disproving our current model, we will move on to a new model. So let's look at Newton. So that's just the way science works, right? So let's look at the models that we have right now. We have Newton's model and Huygens model, right? Initially, there was these two. One said it was a particle. So Newton's corpuscular model said that light was made up of corpuscles, particles, right? And Huygens model said that light was made up of waves. We have these two, right? And we know that we ended up choosing that light was a wave over um, Newton's corpuscular model, right? So what happened? So a couple of different things between them. So Newton was able to uh, Newton was able to talk about or explain using his model reflection uh, and uh, refraction and basic properties like that, right? Newton said that corpuscles were these particles that were attracted to mass. Right. And so if they were attracted to mass, then in a more dense medium, you'd expect these light rays to speed up. Huygens model basically just said that light were made up of waves, right? Similar wave model to what we know so far, a little bit different to the EM wave model that we know or we learned. But nonetheless, he said they were made up of waves. Right. And so therefore, they would display wave properties of things like um, wave interference and wave diffraction. Right. So. What would happen is um, we have experiments conducted that will invalidate a Newton's model and validated Huygens model. The other thing that I should probably mention is that since Huygens said light was a wave, that indicates that light would slow down in a more dense medium like a wave would. So a couple experiments, right? We have Young's double slit experiment, which is the most well-known and probably the primary example to give. Young's double slit experiment demonstrated the wave properties of diffraction and interference. Diffraction and interference are sign like signifying wave properties, right? And so that supported Huygens model and it disproved Newton's model. It didn't support Newton's model because Newton wasn't able to explain the properties of diffraction and interference. It was able to explain basic properties like reflection and refraction, but not diffraction and interference. So Newton's model wasn't able to account for these observations while, and the, the observations also supported the wave model. So it's like a double whammy. And then we also have another one. So remember Foucault, his rotating mirror contraption that we went through when we are looking at the historical methods of measuring the models of light. Foucault also conducted an experiment where he basically tried to check if his measured value for the speed of light would increase or decrease if he made light travel through water. And surprise, surprise, what he found out was that when he added water, right, and light had to travel through water, he calculated he basically calculated that light would take longer to travel. So light would travel slower. So you found a slower value for the speed of light. And this, again, this uh, disproved Newton's model or it invalidated Newton's model, right? Because Newton's model indicated that these corpuscles would speed up when entering or accelerate when entering a more dense mass, when in reality, they would slow down following Huygens wave model. So we have these two experiments that led to our, our acceptance of Huygens wave model. And then we moved from Huygens wave model to Maxwell's model that light was an EM wave. What led to that? Well, we have Hertz's discovery of EM waves, where basically he considered, he basically set up an AC power supply between a spark gap, right? So he had one coil and another coil. He set an AC power supply in this coil and he found that this coil sparked, right? And that indicated that the electromagnetic waves, right? It was the first observation of electromagnetic waves, right? And then we also have polarization, so polarization feature of electromagnetic wave again. So these two phenomena then led to our acceptance of Maxwell's model that light was an EM wave. So uh, I also wrote four things about what Maxwell did. He unified electricity and magnetism to four theories. We went through those four theories earlier. Gauss's law, Gauss's extension of Gauss's law, Faraday's law, and um, uh, Avogadro's law, I think. Or is that Av I can't, I can't remember probably this. Let me go back real quick. Uh, it was, oh, wait, no, that was module, oh, no, yes, that was module seven. Uh, Maxwell had, uh, Ampere's law, sorry, not Avogadro's law, that's chemistry. Um, so yeah, Gauss's law, Gauss's law, Ampere's law, and Faraday's law, those are the four laws. Unified electricity and magnetism. The other thing that he did was, what else did he do? He predicted the speed of EMR, uh, EMR waves using his equation, and he predicted that light was an EMR or EM wave 
because the predicted value for the speed of light was very close or kind of identical to his um, calculated value for EM radiation. So using that like similarity, he kind of predicted that light was an EM wave. Um, but yeah, that was Maxwell. And then we moved from Maxwell to Einstein's quantum model, right? Which we didn't cover yet, but we will cover right now. So what caused us to move from Einstein, uh, Maxwell's model to the quantum model? Well, it was the ultraviolet catastrophe and the photoelectric effect. So the ultraviolet catastrophe, which we went through, right, the ultraviolet catastrophe basically was like the classical model for physics couldn't explain how intensity would increase to infinity as our frequency increased or as our wavelength decreased, right? And then uh, Max Planck came along and he was like, nope, energy is uh, emitted in quanta, right? Discrete part, discrete quantities. And he was able to map it to match the observed effect, right? Using this, Einstein was able to then formulate the quantum model for light, basically said that light was made up of photons and the energy in these photons would be denoted by E equals HF, similar to quanta, right? And different properties, right? So the frequency would be relating to the energy within each font photon, right? So if the frequency increased and the energy within each photon would increase as well. And intensity of light would then be referring to the number of photons that are released, not the energy within each photon anymore, but the number of photons uh, released. And this is important when we're relating to the photoelectric effect because a photoelectric effect was essentially, um, we would shine light on a metal and then we would uh, observe an electron being emitted. The reason for this occurring is a photon, assuming it had enough energy to break the electron from the hold it has on the, or from the hold the metal has on the electron, assuming it has enough energy to allow the electron to break free, it will eject that electron essentially, and will basically observe that. So it's the, it's the full transfer of the energy from the photon to the electron. Um, this is where frequency and intensity come into play because each photon has to have enough energy to overcome the threshold, um, the threshold requirement for the energy, right? Because the electron is held by the metal with a certain amount of energy. And so the photon has to overcome this energy barrier to eject the electron, right? And this is called the work function of every metal. Each metal has its own unique work function, right? And, and the threshold frequency is representative of the frequency that the photon has to overcome to eject, um, the electron. And since frequency is proportional to energy, it's kind of the same thing. Different different units and representation, but it's kind of the same thing. So yeah, um, assuming that uh, photon the photon will have enough energy, increasing frequency will increase photovoltage, right? Because the emitted electron will have greater kinetic energy because the surplus energy the photon has will be transferred into the electron's kinetic energy. And the greater the photons, or the greater the light's intensity, the more photons we're ejecting. And so assuming all these photons are above the work function, we will eject more electrons. And so generally our photo current will increase when we increase intensity and our photo voltage will increase when we, intend when we increase frequency. So yeah, that is a summary for the light models. Think of it as a story. So we move between different chapters. Each chapter is a different model. So we have Newton's model. And then within that, we have the experiments moving on to Huygens model. And then we move from the experiments to Maxwell's model and then we move from experiments to Einstein's quantum model so yeah it's all kind of like a journey and then we can look at light and special relativity so let's look at Einstein's postulates then so Einstein basically said that the speed of light in a vacuum is an absolute constant he said that all inertial frames of reference are equivalent these are his two postulates right and this led to these formulas right so we think about, so knowing these formulas is one thing, understanding them is another. So this is time dilation, length contraction, and relativistic momentum. These are all on your data sheet, so you don't need to memorize them. But with the amount of questions that you're doing in HSC, you'll probably end up memorizing them, um, even if you don't mean to. But um, so what are these two postulates? Uh, why do they make time and space relative? So if you look at this, right, uh, if you look at general non-relativistic speeds, 100 plus 200, so in terms of what this spaceship will experience, it's moving at 100 and it sees another spaceship moving away from, uh, moving like towards it at 200, right? So the speed that it will see the spaceship moving at is going to be relative. So this spaceship will see this spaceship moving at 300 meters per second, right? So um, in this case, however, 
right? If we do apply the same thing, that will mean that this spaceship will see this spaceship moving at 1.2 C. That doesn't make sense because the speed, the speed of light in a vacuum is an absolute constant, right? So that would mean that it would appear that this spaceship would be moving at a speed of light of C and not anything above C, right? Because C is the absolute constant. So that's where the relativity comes in. That's where it gets tricky. So question, why do the postulates make momentum relativistic? Well, implication, if you want to move faster and increase momentum, you need to apply more force. An increase in velocity is equal to an increase in mass. An increase in mass is equal to more force needed to needed to accelerate, right? And the cycle goes on and on and on. So the more we need more force to increase the momentum, right? And that, that would like that cycle kind of just continues and that leads to momentum being relativistic as momentum and mass approach infinity. So does the force required to speed up the object. And so that will also approach infinity. And so we'll reach this cap, right? And we'll reach this cap at around the speed of light. And so momentum becomes relativistic because we're, we have V in it as well. So, yeah, in terms of determining which frame of reference to plug into the formulas, the rest frame is a frame of reference that has no relative motion to what you're to what you're measuring. So if they say that um, in a lab, a muon is demonstrated to have a half life of or when a muon is stationary, it has a half life of two seconds. That would mean that um, that would mean that T naught T naught will be two seconds because T naught will be the rest frame of reference or the true true time. Right. And so the true time will be two seconds because muons from the perspective of a muon, it will be um, it will have a half life of two seconds. So what I'm trying to say with this sentence is the frame of reference that has no relative motion to what you're measuring. The only frame of reference which will have no relative motion to the to what you're measuring is if we're looking at the frame of reference of what you're measuring in. So if I'm measuring the, the half life of a muon, which travels at relativistic speeds, right, to find T naught, I will have to look at from the perspective of a muon. So because a muon is not moving in, in it, um, like a muon isn't moving with respect to itself, right? Because it is, it is itself. So a muon will see that it will have a half life of two seconds. If that's its case, I'm making up this two second value, by the way, it's just an arbitrary value. If the muon sees that it's traveling at a value of two seconds, that will indicate that the muon will have the half life T naught of two seconds and its relativistic speed will be, or its, or it's dilated half life will be what we measure. So that's something to keep in mind as well. So let's go through a question now. The rest length of a train is 200 meters and the rest length of a railway platform is 160 meters. The train rushes past the platform so fast that when observed in the platform's frame of reference, the train and platform are the same length. How fast is the train moving? So to do this question, we'll do, we'll employ length contraction, right? Because the train will appear contracted from the, the platform's perspective. So from the platform's perspective, the train will appear the same length as the platform, which will be 160. Whereas the real length of the train, right? The real length of the train, the rest length. So there are different ways that questions will say it, but they will all mean the same thing, right? The rest length, which means the train isn't moving. So if it's not moving, then we can see its true value, right? So the rest length of the train is going to be 200 meters. So L naught will be 200. So 160 is equal to 200 uh, times root one minus V over C is squared. So we need to, we're well, trying to find V, right? So if we rearrange the formula, so V over C squared is equal to uh, 160 divided by 200 squared minus one times negative one. And so V will be equal to 0 0.6 C. So V will be equal to 0 0.6 C and so will be A. So yeah, with that, that brings us to the end, the end of our session. So um, yeah, we went through module five, module um, six, module seven. Uh, if you guys have any questions, make sure to put them down in the, the live chat box or on the side, right? Uh, yeah, just, uh, it's a lot of content, right? But I really hope my, I really hope that, uh, this makes a lot of sense because this is a lot of content that you guys might like have a high chance of getting tested in when it comes to trials, just because you learned it like very recently. Right. So I really hope this content makes sense, right? um, like how you move from one model to another model. And with, in terms of module six and module five, I really hope that, um, L E O and G O make sure to remember those. Cause that's like the only content that you will learn in module five. And so that's very high likelihood of testing. If they're going to be testing on content for module five, make sure you know your calculations for module five and module six as well, your definitions for Faraday's law and lenses law. And yeah, 
if you guys don't have any questions, then it's been a pleasure going through this lecture with you guys and good luck with your trials and future exams for the HSC.